Ah, yeah, I turned the camera on. All right, uh, so I'll just point out, uh, Logos for Losers, uh, what used to be uh, Jay Sounder <laughs> a long time ago, um, a vet now, and such. Well, anyway, he did a little video. Well, I, I mean, a little video. I mean, he's describing the anti-bullshit man um, video. I mean, uh, blog. And I haven't finished it, obviously. I'm only four minutes into it. Just mentioning it, uh, you know. Um, trying to work it out what exactly the point is of this argument. This argument from something like um, you don't have to understand the truth to be a you don't have to understand the maze we're functioning in to be a good maze runner. Something like that. <laughs> yeah, right. Sure you don't. Um, so anyway. Uh, Santa Bullshit Man, yeah, it's a disappointing response from him. Um, uh, basically just saying, blah, 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 I don't care what you say. Um, yeah, you, you start this fight, asshole. You're the one making the accusations. I think I pointed out how your accusations are shit. And then you're telling me you want me to provide evidence. Your evidence is shit. All right, so he, he's mentioned again some stupid link he posted to proof that uh, you don't have to understand reality to be a, a great social activist and a great productive human being and his evidence is <laughs> with the what the inheritance loafers gave their money to the you know 50 most generous donors of the rich and greedy and putrid and disgusting the ones living off the sweat and death of the workers um the kings how much money did the kings give away, give us back, right? It's almost like the Catholic Church, right? I mean, it actually will rape your babies, and then it will comfort you by saying, can I suck your son's dick? I mean, this is just hilarious as an example of do-gooding in the world. Where did most of the money go? Fucking higher education, right? Th these are institutions that pay fucking ba women's basketball coaches million dollar salaries. M women's basketball. I mean, as if regular basketball isn't ludicrous enough and silly and insane. They, and these are just the coaches, right? One of the publicly subsidized universities in this state, you know what they did with their money? They spent $350,000 on a fucking conference table. A conference table. That's what the leadership of higher education thinks is a good way to spend $350,000. That's how clueless, that's how up their own ass this whole fake facade of lords and noblemen are, okay? We're living in a fucking monarchy, okay? Where the rich, look, the, know, what, know what they gave the rest of the money? Family foundations. The biggest, get yourself a big juicy salary for doing absolutely nothing thing you could possibly have. It's like the organizations like are curing cancer or some kind of bullshit. No, all they're doing is getting big fat salaries, coming up with silly ideas like, let's all tie pink ribbons Let's have them sewn on our eyebrows, and then we'll walk to Minnesota. And we'll raise $42 in net profit. I mean, it's not even a lemonade stand. I mean, a lemonade stand for cancer would make more fucking sense than these stupid goddamn fucking events where they raise a big ton of money, but they also spend a big pile of money. Marketing. Selling propagandizing. That's what these foundations, know what their number one expenditure is? Propaganda. Pamphlets, like the religious cunts. Sell the shit. Shove it in, shove it in the hotel drawers. <laughs> you know, you put it on Google. Uh, you know, another thing bred in an institution of higher education. Yeah, that's the only place you can come up with a brilliant idea. Let's make the biggest marketing company in the world that sells absolutely nothing of value, commercials, uh, and we'll all pretend it's not evil. Oh, fuck you. This, this argument in itself is so fucking ludicrous. These people are raping, 
Okay, they're they're fucking. It's like the Scrooge argument. As much as I love a Christmas Carol as a redemption story, and obviously it is a redemption story, so it does call it creates the theme where the nihilist turns into the realist, or the selfish fuck turns into the oh my god that was so idiotic, right? <clears throat> but the truth is he can never undo what he did. He he gained all his money by driving people into the fucking poorhouse, by ruining their lives, by creating orphans. And then he shows up in his later in life and says, oh, now I'm going to be a great guy and everybody's going to love me. So it's really piss poor. Right? <laughs> it's, not, it's not the answer. Make the mess and then clean up 10% of it and call yourself a fucking hero. This is Michael Jackson syndrome all over the fucking place. In one year, the guy made $10 million and, it, and he had a fucking publicly televised charity event where he gave away $25,000. Can you believe it? They actually had a press conference for a $25,000 donation. So he gets all this PR that he's a wonderful human being for spending $25,000 of a $10 million profit year. And he's called a great humanitarian. What a great man. He's put on fucking network television as an icon of generosity and goodness. Fuck you. What do you think this foundation money is invested in, jackass? What do, you, what do you think these fucking institutions are made of? They're making profits by exploiting the fucking workers every fucking day. They're gleaning huge profits and then spending a tiny percentage of it and throwing it back to the shit, right? But most of the money is spent on their own infrastructure and you goddamn know it. A tiny percentage of the money goes to the cause. The rest of the money goes to a bunch of elitist motherfucking pricks who want to do the Scrooge thing, who want to feel good about themselves and say, I am a redeemed human being because I gave back 1%. All right? I saved one fucking kid from being raped after I raped 100. Oh, sorry. I didn't want to do this video, but... <clears throat> I... I, I I was going to avoid it, but I said, oh, Gary, it's just going to piss you off. <laughs> and yes, it did piss me off. So fuck you. Fuck anti-bullshit, man. Fuck him if he's going to use an argument like this as a fucking example of what's solving the world's problems. This is the solution, he thinks. He thinks these people are going to solve our fucking problems. He thinks these people are doing actual good in the world. This is his definition of actual good in the world. Zuckerberg, Mitchell... Bloomberg. This is actual good in the world. Fuck you. So, yeah, you're <laughs> condemned for that alone. So what I really want to do with these videos is <clears throat> take these basic themes of these assholes, statements they make, and I'll, I'll just and then I'll just point out, no, this is reality. Here, here it is, a simple story. And I guess what I'm really going to do is I'm just going to have to write it in just simple run, spot, run format, right? Spot is a dog. Spot has eyes. Spot can identify round, red ball. Spot, because of a genetic defect, likes to chase things because chasing things aids food. So Spot associates ball with maybe fuzzy rabbit, but it's not really a fuzzy rabbit. You know, that kind of thing. Because apparently that's the only way... That, I mean, you're going to ha I have to reduce this into some sort of language you fucking idiots can understand so you get out of this fucking uh, nonsense language you got to talk. Meta this, anti that, uh, uh, hyper this, hyper that. Uh, fuck you, tautology, ontology, babology, sociology, nanology. Fuck you people and your fucking bullshit. Idealism, realism, physicism, businessism, materialism, business... Fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. Um, anyway, I'm sorry, I still can't hear, so I might be obnoxiously loud. <sighs> I might be obnoxious. And also loud. Anyway. Alright, so, do I have anything else I have to show here? Oh, no, I won't bother with anything else. Uh, let's just find a place for the camera and get on with business. Um, <clears throat> yeah, just to do my spiel. Uh, so, anti Kantavan, right? So, in his most recent video, this is a theme he keeps talking about. He actually said, all belief is just faith. So, he basically just said that if I believe this battery 
is made of uh, a chemical compounds that it was constructed because of a deliberate recognition that we discovered certain properties of certain elements and compounds and we put them together because they make a, a an electrical potential arrive at the two poles of this object blah 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 you know that whole thing that theory of why, how this battery came into existence is just as legitimate and just as illegitimate as Jehovah a made up biblical written story that has absolutely not one single shred of evidence outlining its origins or anything it's just complete bullshit so those two things are equal hell heaven the notion of a god all that crap is the same as me understanding this battery yeah right how, how do you take this seriously right how do you have a fucking rational conversation on earth with assholes who will do this to language who will say that all belief is, that's what all belief is. All belief is faith. All belief, that there's no difference in terms of the credibility, the, substantial, just the substantialness, the, the integrity of any statement that comes out of somebody's mouth. They're all equally nonsense. Bullshit. Bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. I mean, it's just disgusting bullshit. It's so disgusting. I mean, like I said, I, I just, I don't see why we don't have a law that says you just shoot these fuckers. Somebody says something that outrageously stupid, they really should be shot. Because there's just no fucking point. I mean, you obviously can't play this game at all if you're going to sit there and say faith equals evidence. Evidence belief. Evolution is faith. Even though it took years and decades, people have worked on this. All the scientific experiments to get the genome, to understand the processes, to, 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 to make the microscopes, to do all the analysis. All that work just negated as nothing. No value to it whatsoever. It might as well just be written in a book of fantasy. I might as well just make it up. I mean, it's just so fucking... It's such a non-starter for any kind of rational existing. You can't rationally exist if people are going to do this to words. There's just no fucking way to rationally interact. Uh, all right, so enough of that. So, look, here's the story. Uh, <clears throat> now, the first thing you really got to know about life is that we came from a process. So we, are learn we have learned through the last 10,000 years. So, so that's kind of like the context to understand here, is that we've been developing an understanding. We, we, didn't, we weren't given one. We had to discover it. Okay, so you know, that's sort of a, a, a necessary context to just understanding why there's so much error in so many of the things that we have fallen into. So many, so why error is such an important thing to look for. It's just the fact that we had to make this thing. It's still in the process of being made. But that doesn't mean that everything is error. You know, when we, some of these things we found out, well, never, they're not going to change. They're not subject to the same revisionism that other conclusions are. So it's just you need to sort of understand that context, that because we have made mistakes in the past does not mean we will forever make mistakes. It just means that over time, what we are saying will become more and more and more reliable and eventually all the bugs will be weeded out and what I'm arguing is that we're at the stage where we should be pretty certain that we can weed out all the meaningful bugs that we can say things assertively and definitively and in them and with quite a bit of of sincere confidence not propagandist confidence, sincere confidence, that it really has been demonstrated beyond any reasonable conjecture for any alternative theory, that no alternative theory will ever, there'll be no set of facts that can change this truth. All right, and so I would argue that we're sort of like, we're, we're there. And it's just the people, you know, now they're running from it. They're running from the there-ness because they don't like the story. And Antikon is a perfect illustration because he says things like the truth is the facts are there for him to use. He's looking for utility in truth. He's, he's saying, how can I 
fuck somebody with this? Or how can I fuck myself with it? How can I eat it? How can I, you know, how can I gain pleasure out of it? He has no, he has no understanding of what the truth is really for, which is to improve your function, not to make you happy. Uh, which is part of this whole thing of understanding the context of your existence. The context of it. You know, yes, you were made to be happy. You were made to seek your comfort. That's what you've been designed to be. But also clearly, we can understand that that's a DNA molecule's plan for you. That, that isn't an intelligent plan. Intelligence can realize that there is a more important agenda existing uh, in the context of your life and that at that agenda is is that you're not the only thing in need of comfort <sighs> that comfort is valuable because the DNA molecule made it so but your comfort is not the universe there's a whole bunch of needed comfort anyway um, that doesn't need to exist, obviously. All right, so look, you start with a material universe, and and I, you know you can almost argue. You know, I want to do this in a physics video, but I might as well do it now. That the entire universe, there is no nothing. There's just little somethings, and they're just smashed next to each other. You know, just little cubes. So the whole universe is just little cubes, and then what's happened is is the little cubes have ooh, little little you know little jolt. And they vibrate, and the jolt vibrates through them. And the vibration moves at the speed of light. So when something pushes, it pushes that thing, and that thing pushes that thing, and that thing pushes that thing, and that thing pushes that thing, right? So you could almost say that the whole universe is solid, and it's just these cubes, you know, moving a vibration, just pushing. One guy pushes, the next guy pushes, the next guy, like dominoes, except they're just cubes pushing. And that once you have a vibration, the vibration goes forever. Nothing can ever stop the vibration, right? Because in this cube universe, there's no such thing as friction. So, so the vibration just goes forever, theoretically, through the cubes. And um, so what happens is, is like, like, all, like, like all the explosions you know of, there's this idea that, that you know, some of the stuff flies out free, goes really fast and disappears. But then some of the explosion gets stuck. It gets caught. It can't push the heavier pieces fast enough and it ends up creating pressure behind that heavy stuff. And so like in a nuclear bomb, lots of things, it has this uh, very high, you know, it has, it has stages of its, of its development as, a, as an explosion. And there's stages where there's very, very high pressures created. And that's what happened with the Big Bang. The Big Bang is essentially the biggest nuclear explosion ever. See, you can make as theoretically, you can make a nuclear bomb infinitely big. It doesn't have a theoretical limit. You know, you could make a, a nuclear bomb the size of the Earth, you know, and it would blow up a galaxy, theoretically. That kind of thing. Um, it's just the release of what are trapped vibrations. So, so those little cubes I was talking about before, that's what, that's what matter's made out of, is a bunch of cubes, vibrations spinning around in circles. And when you release them in a direction, that's an explosion. All right, so um, let's look, this is what the universe is. All right, so it's this mechanical thing. And what happened is, is we're trapped in this pressure field of the explosion. And in that pressure field, there's stuff coming from all directions because the stuff is bouncing off. See, see the heavy thing gets moving, right? In, in like the heavy bit, the piece that broke off, it still didn't, 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 didn't particularize. So the heavy bit is, that can't move as fast as the little bits. You can sort of understand that, right? So the big bit can't move as fast as the little bits. And the big bit slows down, and then stuff bounces off of it. The explosion actually bounces off of it. And that's sort of what we're in. We're in a bubble, and it's, the stuff is coming at us from all directions the photons, the gravitons, and that's what gravity is. So anyway, the whole universe is held together
by gravity. This this is the only force is gravity. Gravity is magnetism. Gravity is electricity. Gravity is the nuclear force, the strong force, the weak force. Gravity is everything. Everything's gravity. Gravity is gravity. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, and that's the way it works, right? The whole thing is held together by this pressure. So anyway, so so but now you have this trick. So this one little stupid trick in this whole fucking idiotic field of little squares and vibrations. There's one little circumstance that's just really dopey, and that is is that if four of these things come together, it has to be four. See, two would make it simple. See, I could make the example really simple with two. I could just say, okay, there's two things that are coming this way, and the pressure, okay, is coming at both ends. And they're, see how they would block the pressure? Pressure blocked, pressure blocked, and that would end up pushing them together, and they get caught in a spiral. Well, the trick is there has to be four of them because... The speed of the the, the pressure bits, the grav the the, the <clears throat> quantons, the pressure of the little bits coming down has a speed, and the speed across the diameter the circumference is bigger than the diameter, so it wouldn't work out. So you have to actually have four of them that, like this one blocks the gravity of this one, this one blocks the gravity of that one, so it has to be four of them. Well, anyway. And they get caught in a spiral. So there, there you go. There's the beginning of the material universe. Okay, that's how matter is made. All right, and so that becomes the proton, the neutron, the electron. That's what those are. Is a collection of these little bits caught in gravity, um, nuclear gravity. All gravity is nuclear. Okay, <clears throat> and uh, it's just obviously stronger. You know, when it comes to the to the nuclear, the, the atomic bits, gravity is obviously a stronger force because it's, the bits are hitting are proportionally bigger. <laughs> They're closer to the size of the graviton. Duh. I mean, Einstein should have been able to figure that out, for fuck's sake. Um, piece of crust on my keyboard. Um, anyway. All right, so... Um, yeah, I've only gotten to the material universe part. All right, so it's material universe. Okay, so this stuff starts collecting together, and you can, you know, it, we have this understanding of the elements. Okay, there's this table of possible configurations of these swirly bits in 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 what could be called galaxies. Okay, as a, as a metaphor to atoms, you know, these these galaxies of of uh, of trapped vibrations. Uh, bits. So a galaxy of bits and it becomes this atom. And this atom has its own set of properties. So now it's like a, its own little bit with a little bit of gravitational capacity. It's got the same blocking capacity that the little bits had. And they're still blocking the same gravitational gravitons. They're still little tiny gravitons, but there's zillions and zillions of them. Tons of this vibration shit happening. The vibration's all fucking full. The air is full of this stuff moving, these squares being pushed in a direction. Uh, <clears throat> because we're in the pressure part of the universe. High pressure. Very hot where we are, so to speak. Um, all right. Uh, so anyway, so you've you got these elements, and then the elements can combine, you know, gravitationally. Uh, and, uh, you know, by... You know, the gravity's a little subtle in the sense that they're sharing a planet. So it's like two solar systems come together and they end up sharing Pluto as the thing that ties them together. And that's sort of what molecules are doing. So the, anyway, the molecules can attach to each other based on what kind of planets they have available for attachment gravitationally. And uh, they come, become compounds. So then, well, so you have all this stuff in the universe. You have these basic elements, and then you have almost an unlimited way of combining the elements into complex globules of compounds. You know, big giant molecules can be created, and one of the big giant molecules is this DNA molecule. It's this big giant chain of a bunch of, um, you know, ten or fifteen compounds. So there's those ten or fifteen compounds you know, kinds of uh, junk, and it can arrange that junk in such a way, and it sustains itself in that condition. And these DNA molecules can be 
really, really huge, long, 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 long strings of connections of these this stuff and this double helix thing and all that shit you hear about. So it has a structure that, uh, that affords it to do this. It gives it these properties. And then this molecule can create chemistry because it's sort of the way it's constructed. If stuff hits it, it'll play with it and it will combine it with other stuff and create a compound. So it's really a little chemical engine. So we think of it as being, you know, this thing that just carries blueprint information, but it's more complex than that. And so in the evolution of life, the DNA molecule and its, it originally was a worker. The DNA molecule actually made chemistry in its original, in its earliest days. It went to work and then it retired and just became a smart guy that just told people what to do, that kind of thing. That might be a metaphor for it. It's, it's transitioned in its function over the, through the evolution and certainly through the early stages of evolution. So anyway, the point is you have this complex molecule that can do these complex things and one of the things it ends up being able to do is copy itself, okay? It can tear in half and all the bits that were on the other half end up collecting on this half because of the way it's made and the way that it, it, um, things can attach to it. But it needs to be in kind of a clean environment for that to happen because if it's not in a clean environment, little bits of arsenic or some other kind of chemical that's similar to one of these amino acids could end up sticking to it and fuck the whole game because they don't have the same properties. So that's the, the necessity of the nucleus and all of this kind of stuff to create well, the membrane, the cellular membrane, um, a filter that would prevent um, dirt from getting into the process. So it creates a clean environment where this DNA molecule can do this replicating. So that's one of the necessary stages is that there's this importance that's tied to that. And so over time, finally, something happened where there was a filter. The filter was really good for this replicating. And so more replications were created with a DNA molecule that had a filter that lived in a filtered environment. You can sort of just see how this evolution thing starts to work now is things that are conducive to this replication end up getting more replicated. Okay, and so that's the basics of evolution. Success breeds success. So if you successfully replicate, there'll be more of you replicating in the future, and then more of you replicating in the future, and then more of you replicating in the future, and then more of you, uh, you know, and so on and so on, right? Exponential, exponential success kind of curves can be created. And so that's what life did on this planet, right? So it's just this a DNA molecule, and it, as the molecule gets changed by accidents, it uh, makes a mistake. Uh, something, some, some invading <laughs> bit of matter shoots through the membrane, crashes into the molecule, knocks a bit off, but that happens to be an improvement. And now it replicates even better, and it, now it uh, creates even a a better environment inside its nucleus for this replicating process to take place. So eventually, anyway, this, this through this evolution process, I don't want to go through all of evolution of chemistry. I mean, I want to get to the we. Well, you really should know all of this anyway, but whatever. I mean, I really want to just get to the part where we get to the psychological shit and just understand that we're just a psychology. But anyway, I have to do it through this tediousness. And so I'm probably going to be more than one video here. I really don't want to make a whole... See, this is why I, this part just should be written down somewhere. Do it right. Do it once. Get it done. Be done with it. So I probably shouldn't just do this in a video. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah, pause in the middle of the video and say, is this video truly necessary to be done in this format? But, but see, this is the problem. See, there's the simple way to say it. I could just say, look, you get it, right? I mean, it's a replicating machine. It's a Xerox machine. A Xerox machine that can be, that, that mutates, that can break. But it can break in ways that make it even better at making copies. And so you can sort of understand that if, if it can do that, it will morph into something else, something different than what it started as over time. Okay? And that's what we are. And 
so now we, now we just get to the tool thing. So you, what you can understand is now you have all this stuff sitting here competing, all these different varieties, all these different Xerox machines. Now they all started in the same place. They were all, uh, you know, their ancestors, they have a common ancestor. But through maturation, the, the, the lineage, the children of that common ancestor changed in different ways. And now these children are all, the ancestor children, are all fighting with each other. Like the North Americans, Indians, were the same as the Europeans 40,000 40, years ago. And yet, you know, they're the same, they, they were bred by the same organism. The same organism popped them out, you could almost say, as twins. And the two twins went in a different direction and, and eventually ended up killing each other. <laughs> right? And that's what really happened. That's the fact. And that's what's happening on this planet. So you have all these, these lineage of different machines, all with the same heritage, all with the same parents. And they're all competing with each other to put food in their mouth and replicate their molecule. And that's what they're doing. They're consuming and they're reproducing. That's what they do. That's the basic primary function of the machine, is just to replicate successfully. And... But to be successful is tricky in this sea of fucking junk, right? So you can say all kinds of tools could be used, right? So we see that in bugs. They got stabbing tools, and then they got punching tools. They got all kinds of tools. And one of the tools that evolved in this biology, this weapon development of evolution, they, you know, was strategy tool, you know, thinking tool, processing behavior tool. So it wasn't just punching. You didn't just punch with your eyes closed. You punched with your eyes open. So, so you were a much more effective boxer if you had your fucking eyes open. Right? If you had eyes. Eyes made you a better fighter. Um, you know, just obvious. Right? So, so yeah. So, but it's all toolkit. So our whole consciousness exists just because it was a tool to help a stupid molecule survive. It, it was conducive to its survival, therefore the survive, therefore it exists. Now there were lots of great tools that evolution invented that just didn't make it because of bad luck, right? An asteroid came down, hit them, blew them up or something. So all these great tools got destroyed all the time just because that's the way the system works. It doesn't care whether you have a great tool. It cares whether you actually make it to the future. You don't get hit by an asteroid. Truth. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm here because I wasn't hit by an asteroid. That's that's the truth. Um, along with a lot of other pianos that could have fallen on me. <clears throat> so a lot of it's just luck. But over time, yeah, it's not just luck. Over time, what's really going to get tested is, is the utility of these tools in terms of getting your molecule uh, replicated successfully. But again, like I said, it's very crowded here. So success gets really complicated. But success isn't just fighting with the other assholes. Success might be find a rock to hide under. Because goddamn, you, <laughs> this game is impossible to play successfully. There's no safety here. So find a rock. And so yes, things start f trying to find places to hide. Things do all kinds of things because that's going to be conducive to survival. And so, um, so you can have strategies that are not necessarily just make copies and throw them into the world. You can have strategies where you take care of your little copies. See, some animals, they just hatch a million babies and just say, fuck you, you're on your own. And then other animals, the strategy is, no, only have a few of them and take really good care of them, protect them, shield them until they're fully maturated and they're really a good monster. And then all of a sudden, some of it's just practical because to make a big thing, <laughs> it takes time. To build it, you know, for, for it to grow. It takes a lot of energy to make it. And to make a complex thing, you know, complex behavior, well, then you have to actually program it, right? So that takes time. So in the higher mammals, you have these organisms that really do take some work because they have to be conditioned and they have to be built. You know, they have to be fed a lot of food to grow and do all this shit. And they have to be um, educated uh, by experience to have any functionality of this hand-eye coordination doing their punching thing to survive. And so we learn how to survive. <clears throat> and so part of that survival, though, will be these, these impulses, these psychology, 
you know, this, this crap in our head, I want. So we want our food and we want warmth and, you know, some boobies and we want the vagina sex and we want uh, hugs. Uh, and then we also have this whole ego thing because we're alpha animals, you know, where you, <clears throat> we have this internal competition with our own siblings and with the other animals to decide who's the best. See, it's another little sub-competition in the big competition. So our tribe is, is competing with the other tribes, and then inside the tribe, we're competing with each other's individuals for who's got the best junk, the best tools psychologically and physically. Uh, so he does more of the replicating, right? So in, in most mammals, there's a competition interior that uh, kind of gives you breeding rights. Um, and we call that alpha males um and uh, you know that's just another way of evolution improving the, the the strength of the tribe and then the strength of the kind you know and the strength of the did it just another way of of making it a better competing organism is to have all these tests of strength of of, of fitness of ability to uh, master the environment, you know, to fight the good fight for your DNA. Um, and that's, you know, so, so we have this ego thing, this alpha competitive thing, this, I, this you know, me first kind of attitude uh, that develops inside of us because of this syndrome of our psychology. And then we also have the opposite, which is the, you know, people get inferiority complexes and they get intimidated and, you know, that's the whole thing is that, you don't really want it to be a blood fight. You want people to, you don't want too much, us to do too much damage to each other. It'd be, it'd be un, it would be an unproductive competition if we killed each other. Just like the Olympics, you know, it would be more fun to watch maybe if they killed each other. But you can understand mechanically it would be very expensive if they actually killed each other or maimed each other or cut each other's arms off and shit. You know, but then you'd have to patch all of that. It'd be very expensive, blah, 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 blah. So obviously, you, this infighting in the tribe, you don't want to get too crazy, okay? But then your tribe will get fucking annihilated. So you want to create like a, a submissive, uh, uh, what's the other word? Uh, 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 a passive-aggressive, uh, so submissive and dominant kind of relationship where the submissive will back down. So you, we have mechanisms inside of us where we get humiliated or, you know, something else and we just kind of, you know, I suck and we just kind of wander off to try to heal our psychological wounds instead of physical wounds. All right, that's us. But this is what's running us is this bullshit psychology. Now, the real great thing is, is that we have this scheming brain. So, so, so here we are, we, in this evolution process, we were given all this, desire shit, you know, all these um, uh, feel good if you do this, feel good if you do that, you know, pain to, to, to avoid bad things. So we had all this pre-programming, but we also had this capacity now to learn. So we could go into the world and we could, through experience, learn to uh, balance ourselves to almost any environment. So like a goat, we could learn to eat anything or we could learn to live in any kind of environment. We became very adaptive. And there was a very good advantage to being able to live in the desert and live in the mountains, live in the trees, live in the water. It's very good for an organism to have that ability to, you know, think on its feet, so to speak, feel on its feet, uh, move anywhere and, and deal with it. And so we got this scheming tool, this, this device that can register what happens through experience, identify things, symbolize them, represent them with a, oh, that works, that doesn't work, that was failure, this is success. And it could identify the, the bits that led to the success, and it could think and understand. And so this is another piece of, of our, our tool. It's another tool we have, that we have this thing called intelligence, which really is just a modeling machine. It, can give us, it gives us a, a projection of reality, a model of it, and it, it value taints it with our experience, so we can know like things are painted in red, things are painted in blue, things are identified as being this works, this is bad, this is dangerous, and so we start, to, everything gets labeled with these feelings, and this gives us uh, uh, a very enhanced 
we're essentially seeing the future by seeing the past written on our present. So the past is written on our present in terms of a feeling or a sensation or the creeps. Something gives us the creeps. <laughs> you know, that creepy feeling. Uh, and, and so by labeling something with the past, by, by, by painting it with the past, you essentially give you the ability to see the future because now you can see its tendencies, its probabilities, its outcomes. So anyway, we have this brain that can do this modeling thing, but what it can do is model the entire universe. It can label all kinds of things, not just things important to us, but things that are just facts of the reality we exist in. So we can label not just important things like bear, bad, bear snarling, bear running towards me. Yeah, we can label not only just things like that, we can label all kinds of things in the environment. <clears throat> and we can understand that the more we know, the more we know, the more powerful this model becomes because it becomes more and more accurately labeled, more and more accurate definitions. So it's not just colored red, it's colored bright red and it has stop written on it. <laughs> you know, uh, you know we, can, we can make it more and more precise, this model, have more and more precise identification written on it. And one of the precise de things, one of the things we identify is us. And we can, we can write down a whole list of things, of properties of what we are. So we're not just stupid or smelly, you know, vagina good, penis bad. You know, we don't, we're not just that stupid anymore. Now we can understand men and women. We can understand the context they live in. It's not just about their utility. It's about the fact that they actually have brains and they have their own lives and all this kind of stuff. And so that's where this philosophy shit gets in here, where we understand <clears throat> that when we start identifying ourselves, we start just identifying a class of organism, a kind of dishwasher. This is what it comes with. This is the tools it has. This is its vulnerabilities. It can be tortured. These are facts of its existence. And we can understand that, yeah, torture would be bad. Yeah, and comfort is good because we personally experience it. So that's obvious as fuck. Um, and now we can understand that there's this bigger picture game that's being played, that all the dishwashers are doing the same goddamn thing, and they're all producing these sensations, which are the, really the only thing you can identify as being important. I guess I should talk more about that, but I already have, but I guess I, I need to say more about why this sensation thing is separate from all the other crap, why it's different than mug, or battery, or anything. <laughs> yeah, why it's uniquely different in all material existence, but it is. I mean, being conscious and having sensations is completely different than being the moon. Um, completely different, like so much different. I mean, it's, you know, we have things in common with the moon, don't get me wrong, but I mean, so it's not completely different literally, but I just mean it, we are so different in so many ways that the kind of way we're the same is tiny, tiny, and the kind of way we're not the same is huge, huge. So you say completely, but it's not really the truth. Almost completely different. All right, anyway. Uh, so, so is born a conversation about what we call ethics, or right, wrong, uh, decent, reasonable. Uh, all these things become viable words now in talking about behavior and what it means to be alive. And so I'm saying we know what we are, where we came from. You're just a machine designed to copy itself, equipped with a bunch of tools that are likely aggressively anti everything else. And you have to understand that that pre existing mechanical bias has nothing to do with good or bad or right or wrong. And that that determination will have to be made by modeling by recognizing cop recognizing things in the world and acknowledging their existence and that their existence has implication so the very idea that my my model is not intrinsically the best model and that the environmental definition of fitness is meaningless essentially it's not a very good definition of fit and that real fitness is you could think of it as what makes things more comfortable? <laughs> what makes things feel better? Right? And unfit are things that make things feel worse. That seems pretty obvious. Yeah, it seems pretty obvious that fitness would have something to do with things feeling good versus things feeling bad. 
And that would be like one of these axioms or premises that you say, okay, this is a fact that's just never going to change. It's never going to be good to make things feel bad, and it's never going to be bad to make things feel good. That's just fucking stupid. Uh, ludicrous theory. So you just kind of say, okay, yeah, you accept that or you're an imbecile. Come on. This, is, this isn't religion. This is like... You personally experience the sensations. You have to be able to tell which one's down and which one's up. You really have to be able to see this, feel this value gravity and understand which way is up. You know, feeling good is up and feeling bad is down. You have to be able to figure that out, right? Ah, oh, fuck. Um, I'm getting tired now. Anyway, <laughs> so the point is, is, is we have this stupid idiotic psychology our, our modeling brain can model the, our stupid psychology as one of the facts. It can recognize that we're fundamentally constructed by an idiot. We're Frankenstein monsters. And that to rise above that, to improve on that model, the biggest improvement will be being very careful about what you do as think, what, 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 what um, you process as facts. And it would be very stupid to say there are no facts. That's just ludicrous. But yeah, you just got you got to be a little bit careful about identifying things and getting it right. I can't call another sentient organism a cup. I have to recognize them for what they are. A thing producing exactly what I'm producing. Experience. Conscious experience. And that I can't automatically just say enemy. Computer. Blah, blah, blah. No, that's stupid. It might be just as good as I am. It might be just as worthy as I am. It might be just as deserving as I am. All these kind of concepts are all things we can now understand and put into the model as relevant. Ideas like fairness, we can understand. A DNA molecule can't understand. We can understand because we have the modeling brain, the brain that can model reality. So we're the only thing that can understand. <sighs> Okay, that's probably enough. I mean, there's a whole, the, the, yeah, the, the, I mean, you could go on endlessly about psychology, right? You could write really thick books about psychology. And the difference between psychology, my personal interests, needs, desires, loves, my taste in food, my taste in women, that kind of mush, and the real meaningful stuff, which is properly labeling what's going on here, not only what I'm doing, uh, but why I'm doing it, and what the other things are doing, and what the fuck has meaning here, what is valuable here. And I'm just saying that's the easiest one of all of these questions. It's the fucking one that just thrown right in your fucking goddamn face as a sentient organism. You, you goddamn know it has significant value how you feel. The difference between... <clears throat> cancer tumor pushing your eye out of your head and you feeling horrible headaches and pain and nausea and all kinds of shit and you sitting in a relaxing chair um, rubbing uglies with your significant friend uh, is goddamn huge these are different universes essentially of uh, you know the difference in the gravity the matter gravity um, anyway it's just not the, it, it, if, I mean, and I was just saying, if somebody's going to say, I deny mattering gravity, I des deny value gravity, I'm just saying, from my perspective, you can't rationally model. You, you're not rationally modeling. You're denying the necessity of rational modeling. It's too fucking insane. I'm just saying that if anything else you're going to go to war over, that's a fucker to go to war over. I mean, slavery is bad, but that's a lot worse. <laughs> I mean, that just is insane. You can't go anywhere good with a model that hasn't properly identified what blood flows out of. I mean, if, you don't, if your model doesn't understand what the good and the bad things are in the world, you're fucked as having any hope of marching through there without squishing an awful lot of valuable shit. And that's the liability of nihilism, uh, irrealism, uh, bibble babbleism, religion, spiritualism, all this mushy crap that tries to say we're something other than the fucking bugs that we goddamn are. 
enhanced bugs. Bug 3. Bug version 3.7. <laughs> yeah. Just a version of the bug uh, plant. Yeah. Anyway. Alright, that's enough. Till next time.